just read the account of one of Jesus's earliest miracles in the town of Capernaum, where he was living, uh, the healing of the man who was paralyzed. And we've read how the man's four friends carried him to Jesus. But when they couldn't get near to Jesus because of the crowds, they made an opening in the roof and they lowered the man down to Jesus. Um, they brought him to Jesus to be healed. But instead of healing the man straight away, Jesus said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, why did Jesus say this? Why didn't he just heal the man immediately as the friends had asked? I think this early miracle of Jesus gives us a real insight into his mission and purpose. Because Jesus knew that sin is the root cause of all human problems, of pain, of illness, of suffering, and ultimately even of death itself. It's not that this man uh, in this, this miracle, this paralyzed man, was more sinful than anyone else. Um, we've seen already earlier today that um, Jesus elsewhere makes it really clear that there's no direct link between any individual's illness and their sins. But in a much wider sense, sin is at the heart of the human condition, the human predicament, if you like. So Jesus came to heal the symptoms uh, and he, he said to this man at the end, as we've read, I, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So Jesus had compassion. He, he, he healed the symptoms of sin. But Jesus also came to heal the deeper problem of sin itself. And this miracle shows us that these words, your sins are forgiven are at the core, the heart of Jesus's message and what he came to do. Your sins are forgiven. So the Bible teaches us that sin has a real power. It has a real hold on us. Sin is a constant of human life. As uh, the letter to the Romans says, uh, thinking back to the first sin, the disobedience of Adam and Eve, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So all men, all people are under sin. We're all affected by it. It's something that dominates our experience and our lives. And sin leads to brokenness and suffering and ultimately to death. Human mortality is caused by human sinfulness. And the Bible speaks about sin in different ways, uh, different ways of explaining what sin is. Here are some of the definitions that we can find in the Bible uh, for what sin means. So sin means missing the mark or missing the target, like an, uh, an archer shooting an arrow and, and the arrow falling short. That's really the basic meaning of the word in Hebrew and Greek. None of us lives up to the mark, to the target, to the high standard of what we are called to through God in, uh, in Christ Jesus. And Jesus shows us the example of how we should live, but we all fall short of that example. Um, Sin is, uh, brings about a separation from God. It stops us having a full relationship with God. It stops us walking in step in harmony with Jesus. Sin can be disobedience, deliberate disobedience or rebellion against God, deliberately choosing evil instead of good. But sin can also be like a power that holds us captive. We know the good we want to do, but we can't do it. It, we're, we're, we're enslaved by sin. It's a power that keeps us captive. So sometimes sin can be something people deliberately choose to do, but sometimes it seems almost as if it's a power that we can't escape from. And sin is selfishness. It's thinking about ourselves instead of others, pleasing ourselves instead of God. So sin is when we get things wrong, when we act in our own interests instead of the interests of others, when we follow our own ways instead of God's ways, when we mess things up in our lives, when we cause hurt or grievance or harm to others. But the good news, of course, is that there is a way out, a way out through those simple words of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Through Jesus, we can find forgiveness and freedom from sin. And so Paul, in, in that same chapter in Romans, draws a contrast between Adam and Christ. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ.
So what is forgiveness? What does that mean in, in Bible terms? Well, just as the Bible uses many different images and ideas to describe sin, it also uses different ideas to describe forgiveness, the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness means that our sins can be blotted out or erased. They are forgotten. They are covered. They are removed as far as the east is from the west. They are washed away and we can be set free from them like a prisoner released from chains. Actually, the basic meaning of the Greek word forgive uh, in the New Testament is let go or release or leave, uh, just like the disciples left behind their nets. Uh, when Jesus called them, we, we read in Mark 1 that they immediately left their nets and followed him. And this is actually the same word for forgiveness. Um, so forgiveness is letting something go, being let go of our sins, making a fresh start, being able to move on, no longer being held back by the things that we've done wrong. Now, of course, we're human. And part of the problem of sin is that we can get weighed down and burdened by the past, even though God forgives us. But perhaps reflecting on these ways that the Bible describes God's forgiveness can help us to see that his forgiveness is real, that our sins really are let go if only we put our trust in him and seek that forgiveness that, that God offers us through Jesus. And the message of forgiveness goes right the way through the Bible, um, not only in the teaching of Jesus, but right the way back through the Old Testament as well. We see in the Bible that forgiveness is fundamental. It's essential to God's character. He is a God who forgives as he said to Moses, right the way back in the book of Exodus, he is merciful, he is gracious. And for those who repent, those who turn around and, and turn to him, he will forgive iniquity and transgression and sin. He's a God uh, who the Psalms say forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases. And it's interesting to see the link there in that Psalm, Psalm 103, between sin and disease. Because as we've seen, they're, they're really they're two sides of the same thing, as, as we saw with Jesus healing the man who was paralysed. Uh, disease and, and uh, all kinds of hu human illness and suffering are, in, in a wider sense, caused by the problem of human sinfulness uh, and mortality. And in the book of Isaiah, um, God makes his appeal to his people to turn away from their sins and to seek his forgiveness, however far they've gone from him. And God says to his people, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And through, so throughout the Old Testament, in the law, in the Psalms, in the prophets, we get this, this beautiful picture of, of God as a God who forgives, who is gracious. He is standing ready, arms open, to forgive all those who turn back to him. And, and seek him with a sincere heart. And so when we come to the New Testament, we find this same message of a God who forgives. Uh, the message of forgiveness was central to the mission of John the Baptist, to Jesus and to the early church. Um, and here we see that um, John the Baptist came proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And baptism in the New Testament symbolized this forgiveness, the washing away of sins and a new start, as John the Baptist pointed people towards following Jesus. And Jesus also told his followers to proclaim a message of repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations. This was his mission, to forgive sins. And the first Christians proclaimed this message, as we see Peter here doing on the day of Pentecost, at the very beginning of the, the early church, the early ecclesia, the foundation of the Christian community. Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that, that message of, of baptism as a symbol of, of turning back to God, of repentance, and then the message of forgiveness, forgiveness of sins was really at the heart of, of the message of Jesus and of the, the first followers of Jesus in the early church. But above all, it's, it's through the cross of Jesus, through his death, that the message of forgiveness has been extended to all people. Among Jesus's last words on the cross was this prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
And this prayer of Jesus shows us so much about his character and his love. Even while he was dying on the cross in this most painful and agonizing way, he was able to ask for forgiveness for those who'd caused him this, this terrible suffering and death. And this power of forgiveness through the cross of Jesus extends forwards to us as well. As we've seen in that message of Peter at Pentecost, through baptism, we can identify ourselves, our own lives, with Jesus's death and resurrection. Baptism is a symbol of our death to an old way of life and rebirth to a new life in Christ. Paul says, you were buried with him in baptism, uh, buried like going down into the tomb like Jesus did, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So by coming to God in faith, faith in the power of Christ's death and resurrection um, as, as a, an acted for our salvation, we can also find forgiveness of sins. Um, the record of our, our debt is cancelled um, as, as Paul goes on here. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we, we find forgiveness and we find a new relationship with God through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, through our identification with that death and resurrection in baptism, and through making a new start, seeking God's forgiveness for all that is past. So we can approach God in confidence that our sins can be forgiven, however far we've gone astray, whatever we've done wrong. As we see in Hebrews, in a verse we also looked at earlier, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the fact that Jesus himself experienced temptation and struggle and suffering means that he can sympathise with all of our weaknesses. He knows our human condition. He knows from experience what sin means. Not that he himself sinned, but that he himself was tempted in the same way that we are. He knows our tendency to mess up, to miss the mark, to fall short, even though he himself was able to overcome. And so through Jesus, we can receive mercy and grace and the forgiveness of sins. But although baptism is that key moment when we express our, our sorrow and our repentance for past sins. We associate our lives with Jesus and express our determination to follow him. It doesn't mean that we automatically stop sinning there and then. Even after we're baptized, we continue to do things wrong. We still go astray, we sin, but we can and we should always turn back and seek forgiveness from God. As John writes in his letter, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we seek forgiveness through Jesus, um, uh, God's, God's love and God's grace will always be there. Our sins will always be forgiven. And by definition, God's grace is not something that we deserve. Grace means a gift. It's the free gift of God's goodness and love, most of all, uh, given through his son, Jesus, for us. So being forgiven means being saved from sin by the gift of God's grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. And we can think of Jesus's um, parable of the prodigal son, the lost son who, who goes astray, but then returns. And in the story, the loving father is, is there on the lookout for his lost son. And he goes running to greet him, even when his son is still a long way off. Um, and, and we read in Jesus's parable here from Luke 15, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And so this, this parable gives us a really beautiful and, and moving 
picture of what God is like. God is the loving father who is on the lookout for us, even when we go astray. He runs to meet us when we return to him. That's what God's grace means for all of us. However far we go away, however much we mess up, God is able to forgive our sins. Of course, there's a practical consequence um, in this for how we act towards one another as well. In another parable, Jesus told of a king who forgave his servant a huge debt. But as soon as that servant left the king, um, he came across another fellow servant who in turn owed him a much smaller debt. And when that fellow servant begged for more time to pay off the debt, the first servant refused. He refused to forgive the debt and threw his fellow servant in prison. But finally, when the king heard about this, he was angry with the first servant and threw him in prison instead, saying, should, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And so from this parable, the story that Jesus told, um, Jesus draws a lesson. He says, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And so there's a really clear message for us as well. If we ourselves have been released from so great a, a burden, greater debt as the forgiveness of all our sins, how much more should we then forgive one another for the smaller things, the smaller wrongs that we do to one another? How much more should we be loving and compassionate and gracious to each other over smaller things? And of course, the same message is found in the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer, where he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So we also should forgive as we have been forgiven. We should seek to show love to others, just as God through Christ has first loved us. But what does it mean for us to be forgiven by God? The forgiveness of sins means, first of all, the hope of eternal life. Remember, death is the consequence of sin. But if we receive forgiveness of our sins, then we can escape the bonds of death, the consequence of sin. And we have the hope of eternal life through Jesus. As Paul says in Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So being forgiven means also the hope of being released from the bonds of death, the, the chains of death, uh, and, and having this hope of eternal life in God's kingdom to come. But this is not just about the future. It's, it's also about our lives now, today, as we seek to follow Jesus. Because being forgiven now means that we have peace with God. The burden of sin, which can cling on to us, which weighs us down, has been removed. Our sins have been taken away as far as east is from west, as the psalm says. And this gives us the freedom to grow and to flourish in Christ. Paul writes in Galatians, for, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And Paul goes on to give examples of how we live now in Christ, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit produced uh, by lives lived following Jesus. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So because we are forgiven our sins have been forgiven and we can always seek God's forgiveness we shouldn't live lives which are, are weighed down or burdened by sin or, or things that we've done in the past. God's forgiveness means we have freedom, freedom to live lives that God calls us to in Jesus, showing these qualities, reflecting the example of Jesus in our lives. Um, this, is, this is what the freedom that God gives us enables us to do. So to conclude, one more example of Jesus telling someone, your sins are forgiven. We started with the example of the, the man who was paralyzed in Capernaum. 
Um, here's another example. When Jesus was eating at the home of one of the religious teachers, Simon the Pharisee, a woman came in and she began to wet his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. The, the host of the meal, the religious leader, was indignant. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this is, for she is a sinner. That's how he defined her. That's how he saw her, a woman who is a sinner. But Jesus saw something else. He saw her repentance and her love. And Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Uh, so Jesus offered her forgiveness with these words again, your sins are forgiven. But not only that, Jesus redefined her identity, who she was. He saw her not just as a sinner, uh, the label that she'd been given, but he saw her as a woman who loved much. Others saw her as a sinner, but Jesus forgave her sins and he renamed her as a woman who loved much. And this is how she is still remembered today, a woman who loved much. And it's the same for us. If we put our trust in Jesus, if we turn to him in faith, if we commit our lives to Jesus through baptism, then Jesus will also say to each one of us, your sins are forgiven. Through Jesus, we also can receive forgiveness of sins and our lives can be changed, can be redefined. We can be given new identities a clean start, uh, a new beginning. Instead of being sinners, we can be people who love much. We can be people no longer defined or weighed down by the burden of sin, but people defined instead by our discipleship, by our commitment to Jesus, by our love for him and for one another. Your sins are forgiven. That's the message of Jesus. It's a message that all of us need to hear and a message we can all receive once we decide to follow him.